Hello, friends. James Stevenson here, back with another edition of What is James's Forecast Now? So uh, I tweeted out my forecast yesterday on Twitter. So let me share my screen with you, and we can look at that together. So on Twitter, you can find me at I cannot underscore enough. That's me. Do not be fooled by the impersonators, of whom there are many. I report a few every week. And uh, yeah, so you can find me on Twitter that way. Go to you know my profile here. Scroll down past my uh, pinned tweet thanking Elon. And here it is. So there's 28 tweets in this thread total. If you hit show this thread, you can just scroll right up to the top uh, pretty quick and see what I'm forecasting. So the, uh, the purpose of this thread, I think, is to prepare people that the Q2 profitability numbers are not going to be as good as the ones we've seen over the past few quarters where Tesla kept breaking records, improving gross margins, et cetera, and to explain why that is. So I'm not gonna repeat everything that's in these tweets. Rather, I'm gonna to try to add more information that doesn't fit neatly within the bounds of Twitter's character limit and share some of these visualizations that I worked on to try to illustrate the story. Um, really, it is that the Shanghai lockdowns uh, in, in China, really confined to this, the you know, greater Shanghai area, are the problem uh, with sales mix, which is an underrated element of uh, financial analysis. People talk about rate and volume a lot. People don't talk about mix enough. Mix matters, and this quarter is a great example of that. Let me open this chart up so we can see it big. Um, so you can see some historical years here, 2018, 19, 2021. And that brings us to where we are today, kind of interrupting this upward trend momentarily for Q2 to be down some. Why is this? It's because at the end of March, right, you know, the 13th week of March, the Shanghai plant was closed when the government of Shanghai locked the whole city down, make, confined people to their homes uh, for a while to try to get that uh, coronavirus outbreak under control. And they left it closed at the beginning of April and for several weeks thereafter. And it only opened up uh, recently, but in a limited fashion. So they've only got one crew working 12 hour shifts, six days a week for living at the factory. I know that sounds like a lot of work for anybody and, and that sure is, uh, they're working hard, but uh, they can't get as many uh, cars out of that factory as they would if they were running three shifts a day. So uh, yeah, fewer weeks of production and lower production efficiency are the, the problems preventing growth from happening in Q2, which otherwise would have happened because Q2 is the quarter that Berlin and uh, Austin are both going to be producing uh, significant numbers of Model Y. Uh, now they're not doing it at a very high profit margin because they're not to their break even uh, point yet. So they're coming with more costs than they are revenue for the moment, but when they ramp, uh, they'll be making lots of money each. And we see that happening here. So you've got uh, Berlin Model Y here. I expect that they'll sell Model 3 uh, eventually from Berlin. If that changes, I'll change my forecast. Um, and yeah, you can see that the Fremont production is growing just fine here. There's no dip until you get to the Shanghai Model 3 and Model Y, which both come down pretty sharply. And then I'm expecting Texas Model Y to, to build and ramp, and then Cybertruck and Semi to come along next year and the year after. All right, so there's the first chart. Let's go to the second chart here. So this is a sexy chart, S3, XY, just showing those four models that Tesla is currently producing. Just a different way of looking at the same uh, information for those four models. I've got the uh, red, white, and blue here for S3X. 
and then the gray ones are the Model Y. So you can really see Model Y becoming most of Tesla's sales uh, moving forward from here on out. Let's go to the third chart here, which limits this down even more. So this is just Model 3 and Model Y. Uh, those are the only two vehicles being produced in Shanghai right now, which is why Q2's bars here are both down from where they would otherwise have been without the Shanghai lockdowns. Because again, we should be seeing a little bump from Austin and Berlin producing some Model Ys. All right, uh, let's see what else we have here. Uh, total production and deliveries. So uh, these are, of course, very closely linked. You cannot deliver a vehicle you have not produced. Uh, so these tend to, to dance a pretty close tango over time. I'm expecting that to be more the case as uh, production scales up on each continent, reducing the amount of over the ocean shipping uh, needed to get vehicles to their buyers. So what, what does that do? It reduces the amount of finished goods inventory on hand at the end of each quarter because you're able to deliver more of what you produce in each quarter and steady out that flow and, and keep your ending inventory numbers low. The next chart here is adjusted EBITDA. You can see this metric, uh, profitability metric, growing over time. These are in dollars here. So they really start to grow a lot once you've got factories up and running that are more profitable than Fremont. Uh, which factories are going to be more profitable per vehicle than Fremont? All of them. <laughs> California is a terrible place. To, to build cars at a low cost. Their labor rates are high, their taxes are high. Um, so it's, it's tough to make a decent profit margin producing cars in California, but it's a lot easier in Shanghai and uh, the cost per vehicle will also be lower in Austin and Berlin, uh, partly due to the uh, uh, technological innovations and the uh, purpose-built design. Uh, there's a pretty good slide in the most recent Tesla earnings release showing the circuitous route that production requires at the Fremont factory that Tesla took over. Uh, it, that was formerly the Numi plant, a joint venture between GM and Toyota. And so Tesla kind of had to adapt the facilities they bought at a bargain price. They didn't pay very much for that facility during the uh, financial crisis, when there were a lot of bargains to be had. Uh, but it, it took a lot of work. And th those buildings were empty too. They took anything uh, functioning with them from an equipment standpoint. So they, they left the broken stuff for Tesla to deal with. Uh, all right, uh, here's a uh, chart showing how Tesla makes its average dollar of revenue. So this is just helpful for getting a sense of scale on, okay, how does Tesla make its revenue? What are the divisions within Tesla that produce sales? Uh, well, automotive is almost all of it, 80% or, uh, or thereabouts of Tesla's sales are coming from the automotive area. I expect that's gonna increase as Austin and Berlin ramp up and sell a lot of Model Ys. Regulatory credit sales were as high as 5% of revenue. Uh, to hear the short sellers talk about it, it was the primary source <laughs> of Tesla's revenue, but you can see here that that's not the case. Uh, usually it's around two or 3%, uh, and I'm expecting that to decline as uh, time moves forward. Uh, leasing is also uh, delivering vehicles, but it's delivering them on a, a lease, usually a three-year lease, after which Tesla gets to have that vehicle back uh, to sell to another owner. Then uh, the energy segment is, you know, uh, solar production, uh, energy storage solutions, that sort of thing. Uh, I've got that coming down uh, as a percentage of the total 
later this year, early next year, and then growing thereafter as Tesla is able to secure more cell supply uh, and uh, deliver more mega packs from Lathrop, uh, et cetera. Then services and other is everything else. So the uh, anything you can buy from the Tesla shop online, anything that you buy from a sales or service center that's not covered by warranty would hit here as revenue. All right, uh, then we've got the how Tesla spends its average dollar of revenue. So spends is underlined here because that's the difference. Okay, we know the breakdown of each dollar of revenue, how we make it. All right, now that Tesla has that dollar, what do they spend it on? Well, mostly they're spending it on automotive cost of sales. So making the cars that get handed over to happy new owners is most of how Tesla is spending each dollar of revenue. That's not too surprising. The energy business is also spending a lot on the products that they sell to people. Uh, a very high percentage <laughs> of the Tesla energy business is spent on cost of sales. They have almost no gross margin, sometimes no gross margin. Uh, services and other is shown here in yellow. That's been declining. I expect that to continue to decline moving forward a little. Then we have uh, research and development. So uh, innovation, building for the future. Uh, <laughs> Elon says he thinks of the entire company as being research and development, but from an accounting standpoint, uh, there, there are only so many kinds of things that can be recorded as research and development expense. There are gap rules for this sort of thing. Then we have uh, SG&A excluding stock compensation. So the selling general and administrative expenses, uh, these are the headquarters expenses in here, uh, all the salaried people not working at a factory uh, are in here. Then we've got uh, everything else excluding stock compensation. So this number starts off pretty small and then gets big over time. I got a question on this one. Hey, why is this getting so big? It's because income tax expense is in here. And the more profit you make, the more taxes you pay. So that's why both of these are gonna grow over time. The more profit, the more tax. All right. Next, we have our non-GAAP earnings per delivery. This is a good thing to look at just to see, hey, how is this trending? Is Tesla getting more profitable as time goes by? And yes, they are. <laughs> Next question. Uh, no, uh, here, here's 2022. I've got a little bit more profit in Q2 of uh, 2022 than in Q2 of 2021. And you can tell that that's true, even though this is a 12 trailing month chart, because the only difference between this bar and this bar, if you think about it, is that we're dropping this Q2 and we're adding this Q2. So if this number is going up, then that means that I'm expecting year over year growth in um, non-GAAP earnings per delivery. But it's not going up by very much compared to the previous trend. So you would expect that it would go up. The reason it's not going up by more is that Shanghai is Tesla's most profitable factory. And they're the factory being adversely impacted by lockdowns, lowering their production levels, which means they'll have less cars that they can sell um, this quarter, which means that there will be less profit per vehicle. It'll be more of those uh, Fremont produced vehicles at a higher cost per vehicle than compared to Shanghai. But that'll pick up again in Q3 and Q4 and we'll be off to the races again. Now, I did note in this big box that you can't miss that I've got $2 billion in deferred tax benefits from prior year's losses. That's uh, 1.6 billion in Q4 of 2022 and the remaining 0.4 billion in uh, Q1 of 2023. I'm only guessing at what the timing of when that will happen. I guess that it would happen here and I was wrong. I guess that it would happen here and I was wrong. So 
we'll we'll see if this is the year. Maybe James is right. Uh, that Tesla will take that one time tax benefit from rolling over prior year's losses. The IRS does you a solid and says, hey, you don't have to start paying taxes immediately when you become profitable. If you had a ton of losses over the years, you're allowed to write those off against the taxes that you owe. So Tesla has that get out of jail free card that they can play uh, and count those uh, write-offs against their tax uh, income tax obligation. And I'll keep moving before I lose the people who do not care about accounting. So here's the same chart again, except this one excludes regulatory credits. Now, why would I do something like that? Uh, it's because the short sellers loved doing this back in 2019. Here's 2019. See if you can figure out why they love doing this back in 2019. Oh, it's because it was negative if you threw out the regulatory credits back then. Yeah, um, even if you throw the regulatory credits out, Tesla has been profitable since the beginning of 2020 on a 12 trailing month basis every single quarter since, and it's only grown. So yeah, there's been growth every single quarter since then. And I do expect a little bit of growth in Q2 of 2022. Let's hope that happens. And again, the same note here about that uh, one-time tax benefit that'll get backed out by Wall Street whenever it happens anyway. So it's not gonna be in the adjusted earnings number, the adjusted EPS. Okay, this chart is informative for us uh, for this quarter. And it's because if you look at Q2 of 2022 here, you'll see this pink bar bigger, especially as a percentage of the total bar size than most of the quarters that came before it. Now, why would that be? Um, well, what is the pink bar? The pink bar is the ending inventory. The blue bar is the beginning inventory. So when we looked at the Q1 report, uh, they reported Q1 ending inventory levels very low, like, you know, three or four days worth of production as ending inventory. That's, uh, that's world-class inventory management right there. I'm not sure there's anybody else beating that number by much. Uh, and you can see how much better that is than it used to be, like Q2 of 2018. That's a huge percentage of the total uh, available to be sold. Well, maybe I'll uh, orient you to what this is doing. I'll, I'll look at Q3 of 2018 here. So the beginning inventory is the blue section. So this is how many finished vehicles were available to be sold on the day Q3 2018 began. Then this orange bar, prod, this is how many vehicles were produced during the quarter. So if you stack those one on top of the other, the height of this thing is telling you there were 100,000 total vehicles available to be delivered during this quarter. Then the deliveries are in green here. So the green is saying, okay, of that 100,000 vehicles, how many did we sell? Looks like we sold maybe 80,000-ish of them. You can go find the number on some of the other slides that show it. And that leaves you with, you know, 20,000 vehicles in ending inventory, something like that. Uh, so the ending inventory from one quarter becomes the beginning inventory for the next quarter. How does that relate to Q1 of 2022? It was very, very low, right? So I've got this moving up quite a bit. Why would that be? Well, we've got our production here in orange these total levels are gonna be lower because of the lockdown. Uh, they're actually being helped by the addition of Berlin and Austin making a lot more vehicles in Q2 than they did in Q1, especially as a percentage. It's gonna be really big growth. Uh, from zero for Austin, it'll be infinite growth, right? Um, but still down due to those lockdowns, right? So you've got offsetting impacts. Uh, then the deliveries aren't going to be able to get us all the way back down to that same uh, level because Shanghai got so far behind shipping vehicles to Europe. So they're supposed to put cars on uh, row-rows, which are roll-on, roll-off shipping vessels uh, to get them to Europe to sell them to buyers there. And if 
a bunch of those vehicles do not make it in time by the end of June uh, 2022, then they're going to still be in the finished goods inventory count at the end of the quarter, not delivered. So that's what's going on here. And then I'm expecting that to normalize itself back out to be more typical of what we've seen recently uh, in future quarters. All right, so that's probably all I should say about that. Here's a chart showing the CEO Performance Award quarterly expense. This is a really difficult concept to try to understand the way accounting rules make you expense this stuff. But I'll give you the simplest way I can explain it uh, quickly, which is back here in uh, late March of 2018, Tesla entered into a compensation agreement with Elon Musk where he would get paid no salary and no guaranteed cash bonus of any kind. What he would need to do to get any kind of compensation is grow Tesla revenue and earnings and market capitalization to very aggressive targets. So uh, in the beginning, there was a very, very thin slice expensed uh, because he was only under that plan for a few days of Q1. And then as Tesla made progress towards achieving those milestone goals, uh, and they had to put together schedules of, okay, this is when this goal became likely or probable of being achieved one day. And here's the date that we think it will be officially achieved. And then we're going to prorate the expense between those two dates, right? That's, that's the idea. And then in uh, 2020, you can see some of these really big amounts clicking here because Tesla's market capitalization rose by so much this year. So as the market capitalization goals were getting locked in, Tesla had to expense more of the compensation for Elon. Fast forward to where we are today, uh, Tesla declared more than half of the remaining possible expense. So it, the, the value of the compensation package was determined at origination using a Black-Scholes model, which I will not go into, as being $2.283 billion. So the maximum amount of money that Tesla can expense ever on this plan is $2.283 billion. And you can see more than $2.2 billion uh, has been expensed already. There's almost nothing uh, left to pay on this. But what you'll see is uh, SG&A expenses down year over year because of this. This hits SG&A. Uh, so your total SG&A expense, you know, this, this block is a lot shorter than this block is. And these blocks are a lot shorter than these blocks are. So your year over year declines are going to be really significant, you know, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 billion dollars worth of savings in each of these quarters for the rest of the year. So people who aren't thinking about that or forecasting that will be surprised uh, or, you know, in the case of the haters out there, they'll be sure that it's fraud and they'll write long threads about how it's fraud that the SG&A expense isn't uh, increasing. But it's not, it's, it's just uh, this for, for right now. It pays to forecast at a detailed level, so you know stuff like that's going on. There was also a, a payroll tax that hit in Q4 related to Elon selling some shares under his 2012 plan. Elon actually hasn't vested any of the shares he's earned, or, or he, has, he hasn't exercised any of the vested shares he's earned under the 2018 uh, plan yet, but he's got a bunch of shares that he can buy uh, for $70 per share once he chooses to. And when I say a bunch, I mean like 100 million shares. Uh, and he'll pay a lot of taxes on those immediately when he exercises. All right, uh, what do we got here? This is average revenue per delivery versus automotive gross margin, excluding regulatory credits as a percent of revenue. All right, so the mountain range here is telling you average revenue per delivery. So that's this axis here, average revenue per delivery with a high of 91,000 and a low of zero. I've got these guys both at zero for the 
access uh, minimum, which is handy because I, I was able to line up these lines so that they match uh, because they're using the same multiple on both sides. That's an advanced free uh, Excel charting tip for you guys if you want to use more than one uh, Y axis. That's a good tip for you. So uh, yeah, the ASPs were really high at the beginning of 2018 when most of what Eli most of what Tesla was selling were Model S and Model X, uh, the most expensive vehicles Tesla makes. But then as Model 3 became more and more of the mix, it dragged down the weighted average revenue per vehicle uh, because most of what Tesla was selling by 2020 was Model 3s and uh, starting to sell some Model Ys here. So as Model Y has been ramping up and as pricing increases have uh, started to work their way through, it takes a while for the prices to hit the P&L uh, when they go up because the backlog is so long for Tesla vehicles. Um, when, when Tesla raises prices, it can take 12 months before those price increases start hitting the income statement. But uh, the trend is up on revenue per vehicle, which is great. The, uh, the remarkable thing about this is that Tesla was able to grow automotive gross margin even before the revenue per vehicle started trending back up again. So while this was going down, this was going up. That is not what you would expect, right? This means that a lot of uh, great work was being done on the cost side. So stuff like the Octa valve, stuff like uh, front and rear castings for Model Y, uh, and, and many, many other uh, cost improvements and uh, also uh, adding more software features that people were paying uh, to upgrade to. All those things helped to make the automotive gross margin, excluding regulatory credits, as a percentage increase over time. Now we're going to take this little hit here in Q2 because of mix and because of the unfavorable impact of Austin and Berlin being below break-even volume in Q2. I think they'll be above break-even volume in Q3. We'll see what we get as guidance from Zach on the Q2 earnings call as to whether those factories broke even uh, if he shares that information with us on the call. All right, uh, next we've got a chart that Rob Maurer inspired. I was trying to follow along with one of Rob Maurer's Tesla Daily videos on YouTube and didn't get the same numbers and had to, <laughs> had to actually reach out to Rob to figure out what he did. So what you need to do here is exclude the leased vehicles, uh, units, and revenue, and cost of sales, and regulatory credits if you want to match these numbers. So that's what I did, and I figured it was a, a pretty good metric he had pulled out. So what you see here is the same uh, dynamic we were just talking about where revenue per vehicle has been coming down and then has bottomed recently and is going to move back up again. Uh, this is throwing out all the leased vehicles and the regulatory credits. Then, uh, so those are the green bars. Then the blue bars here are telling you the average cost of sales for each of these vehicles. So what are the expenses directly related to what the buyer gets when they take delivery of the vehicle? So these are all the, the costs that happen at the factory, costs of raw materials, production, labor, uh, all, all, all those sorts of things. So those have been coming down uh, over time, which is great. Those are also bottoming right around now. And there has been some, uh, warning given on the recent earnings calls about uh, inflation, uh, cost pressures uh, being applied to Tesla by the suppliers that it buys stuff from. They're raising their prices, so it's going to cost Tesla more to make vehicles with those raw materials and parts that they have to buy. But as long as these numbers are going up by less than these numbers are going up, the profit per vehicle will go up. 
Uh, so Tesla tries to plan for the future when they do their price increases because the backlog is so long. They have to think a few moves ahead to make sure they've got the right price now for the costs they expect to see a year from now. Challenging business to manage. All right, now we get to some fun revenue charts. If you want to know what Tesla's revenue has been over the years, this chart gives it to you uh, by year uh, and by quarter, and it gives it to you with numbers, numerals on the, on the graphic, as well as with these bars. And just look at the sweep of Q1 and Q2. And uh, you'll, you'll see that the growth story is not over yet, not over by a long shot, uh, with, with uh, almost $19 billion worth of revenue already in the bank, almost as much as Tesla made in the whole year in 2018. So uh, expect to see maybe a $90 billion or better number by the end of this year. So I'm going to need a bigger, a bigger chart. So here's another revenue chart. This format I borrowed from Tesla Charts, who uh, originated a chart that looked like this one back in, uh, I think it was 2019, and then mysteriously stopped updating and tweeting this chart out after the one he tweeted in Q2 of 2020. Now, why would he have stopped tweeting this chart out at this point in time, it's such a mystery to me. Gee, oh, maybe it's because uh, with only one exception, <laughs> the revenue has been up every quarter since. Yeah, so th this is an actual two. This is not my forecast here. Uh, Tesla did over $18 billion worth of revenue in Q1 of 2022. So just another way of looking at it here. Um, off the chart revenue numbers compared to what this chart once looked like. And here's the last revenue chart, just a different way of looking at it. They call this a tree map chart. I don't know why it's called a tree map chart, but um, you can see a third of all the revenue Tesla has ever made was made in 2021. And this is as of year ending 2021. So I don't have the 2022 Q1, $18 billion and change on here uh, because I just wanted to uh, uh, I liked the neatness of how this looked without adding a quarter of a year. It seems better to have full years on this chart. And I imagine it'll look the same again at the end of this year when I drop 2022 here. 2021 will just move here. 2020 will move here, et cetera. And it'll look about like this again as Tesla continues growing by 50% or better per year. Amazing, amazing growth uh, that competitors would kill for. All right, and here's Stevenson Indicator. I did a whole uh, video series on Stevenson Indicator. So rather than talk about this, and I wonder why this shows up so small. That's weird. I downloaded this directly from the Google Sheet when I tweeted it so that I would get it in the highest quality and maybe that backfired on me. Oh, and it cut off the end too. Vertical lines show variance between actual and Stevenson indicator. That's disappointing. All right, so if you want to know more about Stevenson indicator, I will drop the playlist in the description to this video and you can go watch those three videos I made explaining what this madness is. All right, so that was the end of the charts section. Let's take a look at the income statement. What are we expecting for Q2 of 2022? Well, this number uh, is down versus the prior quarter and the quarter before that. Uh, I'm only expecting 15.1 billion of total automotive revenue in Q2 and expect to see some FUD about this when the Q2 earnings come out from people who don't get it. So they'll say, oh, the growth story is over, uh, the you know bankruptcy imminent. Well, I'll, I'll, they'll be bringing back all the classics, 
when, when this earnings report comes out and the profitability metrics are worse, right? So what do I have for gross margin down here? 24, uh, that's the same as the prior year number, uh, pretty much. Um, operating margin at 14, uh, that's better than the prior year, but worse than the three uh, sequential uh, quarters previously. So th these, are, these are not good looking numbers, but it's going to snap right back in Q3. So again, it's those two drags on profitability happening. The one that I spent the most time talking about during the forecast thread is the Shanghai lockdowns, limiting the weeks of production and the production efficiency with only one shift working six days a week. But the other one is that Austin and Berlin probably won't do much better than break even uh, since they're so early in their respective ramps. But as they ramp to greater production volume, they will become profitable and these metrics will improve, which you see on the chart for the future quarters. So. Uh, Grin and Barrett, when you see that FUD from the haters come through in Q2. All right, uh, what else do I want to talk about here? So yeah, the total revenue will be down because the automotive revenue is down. Um, I never have a lot of confidence in my energy and services numbers, so those are here. Um, Research and development I have being not quite as high as last quarter. We'll see what happens there. SGNA I've got close uh, to last quarter. I do build up to. I don't know. I don't just drop it in right there. So yeah, uh, gap earnings lower than the prior two quarters, but it would be a record versus any quarter before that if that's worth anything. Probably isn't. Uh, okay, so here's the earnings numbers that actually matter, the non-GAAP EPS. So $2.20 is what I'm forecasting for Q2, which is not more than it was last year. It was over $3, surprising a lot of people, almost everybody last quarter who had, you know, less than $3 worth of EPS expected. Let me blow this up bigger so we can take a look at it. Uh, Yeah, what else do I want to say about this page? Maybe nothing, maybe I'll just keep moving. All right, uh, SG&A expense, here's that breakdown that I promised. So I do stock comp versus non-stock SG&A expense to give you the total here. And then stock compensation does come in different expense lines of the income statement. Some hits within the total cost of revenues number reported. So that's the automotive cost of sales mostly. Um, research and development. Uh, and then sometimes you'll see a number come through in restructuring and other. We haven't had one of those recently, but in prior years we did. So I've got a line for it. And then other including dilutive convertible debt buyout of non-controlling interest uh, hits sometimes too for small amounts. Uh, so this profitability number will also be lower. Here's our non-GAAP earnings. There's this non-GAAP EPS number that I mentioned on the previous tweet. So that may not have lined up very well for the reader. Sorry about that. Then we've got the uh, uh, the next 12 months non-GAAP EPS. So uh, $26 is what I'm forecasting for the following 12 months uh, EPS. So these four quarters here against uh, year over year non-GAAP EPS increase of $17. So versus the prior year's uh, EPS, how much is it up by? Hey, look, the earnings growth rate is 173% the highest it'll be uh, because, you know, when you cross the zero line from negative to positive, it's easy to get big percentage growth for a while, but the higher that dollar amount goes, the lower the percentage goes. But that's okay when you're valuing stocks because the higher the base goes, uh, the better off your, um, your, your calculations get. So... 
that information is here. You got PE ratios here for trailing 12 months on non-GAAP and GAAP bases. Uh, next 12 months is a fun way to do a PE ratio, 56. Uh, that's, that's pretty good for a company growing like this. And then I've got the PEG ratio here. So Peter Lynch says the PEG ought to be one. And what I mean by that is if the uh, earnings are growing by 100%, you ought to be okay uh, buying at a PE of 100. That's the idea there. And we've got our favorite Stevenson indicator here as well. My favorite joke technical analysis indicator. Uh, da, da, da. What else do we have here? So here's adjusted EBITDA. That number will be down as well. And the EBITDA margin, of course, will be down as well. Uh, up year over year, but only by a little bit uh, down versus the previous sequential quarters. Uh, <laughs> second verse, same as the first. I've been saying that a lot. Uh, automotive gross margin will be lower. I'm expecting less regulatory credits than we got last quarter. So there was an extra uh, couple of hundred million dollars worth of regulatory credit sales last quarter. That was a one-time item. That's not gonna keep recurring going forward. So these are lower than the actual you see here in Q1. Uh, so if you look at the number excluding regulatory credits, it's not so bad in Q2 and it pops right back up again for future quarters on the strength of the factories uh, ramping and Fremont becoming less and less of the mix, the least profitable factory per vehicle uh, becoming less and less of the mix improves the automotive gross margin percentage for the total global business. All right, uh, what else do we want to talk about here? We've got revenue by type. So this is just your breakdown or my breakdown of uh, what I think has happened in the past by option type uh, that you can configure. And um, there's some adjustments you have to make uh, after the cash buyer line to account for things like lease vehicles the destination and delivery fee, regulatory credits, and other. So what's other FSD deferrals, uh, over-the-air upgrades, uh, data plans, uh, Tesla insurance is in here, a bunch of other stuff. Uh, that counts as automotive, to total automotive revenue. And, um, and the cost of sales is below that. Here's the cost of sales percentages by type. So uh, this is what, what my model has plugged in for these to try to dial in earnings as, as best as I can figure. Tesla does not report in this level of detail. So I have to guess because I, I can never check these numbers and see how, how close I got at this detailed level I can check in total and then make reasonable inferences uh, where, where possible. Then this is a good slide showing the production of each model at each site and totaling up each site. So on this one, for example, for total Shanghai, uh, you can see 182,000 worth of production from that site last quarter, 115,000 is what I have for this quarter, and then growing right back to 200. So if, you know, if this quarter were closer to 200, there'd be 80,000 more vehicles worth of uh, Shanghai production sold this quarter. And the profit, you know, the, the revenue would get better by about 4 billion, a little over $4 billion. Uh, that would come with cost of sales of like two and a half. So you'd have another 1.6 billion worth of gross margin improvement, most of which would fall through to the bottom line. You'd have to pay some taxes on that, but you might get, you know, close to a billion and a half more profit if uh, Shanghai were open. So here you can see the Berlin and the Texas uh, production I'm expecting, about a little, little under 10,000 per site 
that's a guess. We'll we'll see what happens. It's so hard to know early in the ramp how well they're doing because the line stops so frequently. But these are Tesla's latest design for factories, so that could be good or bad. <laughs> could be that there's problems they need to work out that require more stoppage time, or it could be that it'll go a lot smoother because it's the latest uh, thinking on how to uh, how to optimize production. And then the bottom of the page totals it up by model. So you can see worldwide Model 3 and Model Y here uh, because those were produced at more than one site. All right, and then uh, out here in the future, I've got semi and Cybertruck production happening. I expect those to happen in Austin. Well, we'll see. They've already made a few semis in Nevada, but they won't make them there long term, I don't think. Here we have total automotive revenue per delivery breakdown by type and uh, some other fun stuff down here. Gap and non-gap earnings per delivery, adjusted EBITDA per delivery. Uh, good, good stuff like that. Uh, all right out of this one and we're getting very close to the end of the thread now so here's some 12 trailing month metrics here deliveries you can see those growing of course revenue uh, as you would guess also growing really steadily adjusted EBITDA it's kind of the same the same story for all of these right and non-gap earnings per delivery so uh, the the more you can produce at a healthy margin, the better all these revenue and uh, earnings numbers are going to get if you can control costs. So we've got uh, revenue by account uh, line item here and costs and expenses by type. And then below that, we've got some uh, some pennies. This is what you need to do to make that chart that we saw those two charts back on slides uh tweets six or seven wherever those were and cost of sales percentages by vehicle by site uh, so you can see total fremont cost of sales here you know uh, shanghai numbers are better berlin numbers are worse for now but will improve over time uh, until they're better than Fremont's in a year or so. Um, same with Texas, they should uh, be better than Fremont within a few quarters. And the totals here, then we've got the cost of sales percentages for the uh, energy segment and for services and other. A lot of numbers over 100 here, which is not what you want when you're talking about cost of sales percent. But that should improve. Tesla did uh, include a chart showing that these have been improving some over time. And uh, I think they're showing us that to tell us that that trend is expected to continue into profitability. All right, uh, this last one is just the one minus cost of sales number for each of these. So these are the gross margins. If it's in parentheses, that means it's negative. If it's not, that means it's a positive uh, profit contribution. So that is all I've got. And I will cut the video off here and say, if you have enjoyed this forecast review with James, go ahead and click that like button. If you're not subscribed to my channel, why not subscribe? Uh, of course, it's a free country and you know, you're allowed to do what you want, whatever. Uh, but uh, those are my recommendations. And I will see you in the next video.